Labvakar! Labvakar visiem skatītājiem, visās platformās, visās tiešraidēs, kur jūs pieslēgušies. Prieks, ka esmu pieslēgušies 11. jesēs Berlīnes dienas Rīgā atzīmēšanai. Šī ir tradīcija, kas tika aizsākta 2009. gadā, lai svinētu to, ka Rīgā ir piedzimts viens no izcilākajiem 20. gadsimta filozofiem. Un tagad es pārslēgšos uz angļu valodu, kas ir šī vakara pasākuma valoda. Good evening, dear spectators, dear listeners. Good evening and welcome to the 11th Isaiah Berlin Day in Riga, in which the great Riga-born philosopher is commemorated with a memorial lecture. This is the, the 11th time this is happening, and this year, obviously, for the first time, it's online. Welcome every, everybody everywhere in uh, Riga, London, Toronto, T Tbilisi, or I don't know, in any place that from which you are watching us, we are glad that you're with us. My name is Helmut Zaune. I'm director of the Isaiah Berl Berlin Center here in our home in the National Library of Latvia. And this evening you will have the pleasure and honor to listen to the Isaiah Berlin Memorial Lecture delivered by the Canadian historian Margaret, Margaret Macmillan, who is already on, online on Zoom, ready to take over. But before that, we have to say a few introductory words to provide some sort of context for all these happenings. And first, I would like to welcome my colleague and the chairman of the board of the Isaiah Berlin Society, Mr. Valdis Lepic. Thank you very much, Helmut. Um, from the National Library of Latvia in Riga, welcome to everyone viewing this event here in Latvia, elsewhere in Europe, in Canada, and the USA, and wherever else you might be. The 100th birthday of Isaiah Berlin was celebrated in Latvia in a six-day program in early June 2009. The very first Isaiah Berlin memorial lecture, delivered by British historian Timothy Garton Ash on June the 1st, 2009, was a key part of that celebration. The event was organized by the newly established Isaiah Berlin Society of Latvia, together with Duats the foundation for an open society in Latvia. And Duots, with the blessing of the society, has to a large extent assumed the main responsibility for the lectures ever since. And this will be the 11th Isaiah Berlin Memorial Lecture given by another renowned historian. As chairman of the board of the Rejuvenated Society, I wish to offer special thanks to the representation of the European Commission in Latvia for their long-standing moral and material support for the memorial lectures. And special thanks also to Duots, in particular to, do, to two of its indomitable ladies, the executive director, Eva Moritza, and project director, Irina Kuznetsova, for their outstanding contribution in making the Isaiah Berlin Memorial Lecture a much an anticipated and appreciated annual event in Latvia. However, I should mention at this point that according to Ieva, Irina has done most of the work. So thank you, Irina, on behalf of all of us. On this occasion, I would also like to welcome and extend a great big thanks, a great big thank you to our new partner, the National Library of Latvia, which has provided a home for the society in its prestigious building on the banks of the river Daugava. We have mutually agreed with Duots that it is time that Duots gets a break. So from now on, the society and its recently appointed director, Helmut Zaune, will take on full responsibility for carrying the Isaiah Berlin Day torch forward. And a little bit in Latvian now. Paldies fondam Duots, bet īpaši tev Ieva un tev Irīna par jūsu lielo ieguldījumu izveidot un noturēt iesājas Berlīna memoriālo lekciju tik augstā līmenī visus šos daudzos gadus. 
Tā kā paldies jums sabā. Now please join me in a thunderous, but at this COVID-19 time, remote applause to the two magnificent ladies, Eva and Irina, for a job thoroughly well done. Unfortunately, this time I can present, I can present each of you only a virtual bouquet of roses, but promise a real one when we meet once more in person in larger numbers. I think I can just about hear the applause. Do I hear any applause? Yes. And virtually feel the ground shaking from underneath me. So thank you for your attention and back to you, Helmut. Thank you, Valdis, very much for these remarks and for uh, explaining the history for those who don't know about the Isaiah Berlin Day. Indeed, me and we, as the Isaiah Berlin Center and Isaiah Berlin Society will from now on take over the responsibility to organize this lecture and this annual event in honor of Isaiah Berlin. But uh, since the beginning, there is another person who has uh, always stood by and always stood vigil and, and, and blessed this tradition. Uh, and that is the honorary patroness of Isaiah Berlin Day in Riga and also, who also happens to be the former president of Latvia, Vaira Vij Freiberg. And uh, she, although virt virtually would, would also like to say her introductory words before I give the floor to Margaret Macmillan. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we are very proud to be presenting for the 11th time the Isaya Berlin Days in Riga. Over these years, we have been privileged to receive a series of extraordinarily distinguished personalities who have talked both about their own work and that of the great philosopher in their presentations. Today, albeit uh, electronically, if you like, uh, at a distance, uh, I'm very pleased uh, to present a former compatriot of mine, a professor at the University of Toronto, of which I am an alumna, uh, professor also at the University of Oxford, a great and distinguished historian of world fame, and the author of a great many books on history, Dr. Margaret Macmillan. Her specialty uh, has been the study of war, of the British Empire, uh, especially events of the past uh, 200 years. And uh, she has written a number of books that have become popular bestsellers because in addition uh, to her excellent and extraordinary capacity for research and pulling together enormous amounts uh, of material that clarify issues that have often been obfuscated in earlier publications. She has an enviable uh, facility with words. Uh, she's a gifted storyteller uh, who makes history come alive, who makes the reader or the listener in this case feel and, uh, and understand what motivated the people who made history and why they did so. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pride and joy that I give the floor to Dr. Margaret Macmillan, historian, to talk about Isaiah Berlin, the great philosopher born in Riga and his contribution. Thank you very much, Madam President. Um, and although she has already given the floor to Margaret Macmillan, I just would like, would like to say to all, the, all our listeners and spectators online, so in order for this not to be like really one directional event, you have a chance to ask your questions, to submit them in written form to the lecturer who, hello Margaret. 
has, al has already joined us. You can, yeah. Um, there are two ways in which you can do that. Uh, one is via Facebook on various platforms where this video is live streamed. You can write your questions and comments. And the second is on the platform sly.do, but uh, the address is sly.do and hashtag Berlin Day. But now, enough of me, enough of introductions. I think it's high time to finally give floor to you, Margaret. Thank you for joining us. And thank you for, thank you for doing, this, doing this. So please welcome. the 11th annual Isaiah Berlin lecture and of course my giving it is mixed with regrets because I'm doing it virtually. I had hoped so much to be able to come to Riga and to meet you all and this of course is what we do these days and, and we have adapted but as I say a certain measure of regret in giving the lecture under these circumstances. I'd like to give before I start many thanks to the Isaiah Berlin Center and the Isaiah Berlin Society for organizing this lecture. And of course, to Madame Dika Feiberger, who is, I know, the fellow graduate of the University of Toronto for her generous and thoughtful introduction. Isaiah Berlin, as we know, was a philosopher who became an historian of ideas. He understood what I would call the necessary messiness of history. It's an eclectic discipline. We borrow from other disciplines, from literature to sociology, we are constantly asking questions and we are constantly revising what we think about the past and that, to my view, is what it should be. Berlin steered in his appreciation of history between those who saw only the personal forces of work, great forces such as economics, demography, geography, political and social institutions or ideas, and those who stressed the role of the individual as being key in moving history along. Berlin was in the middle, and this is a position that I find very sympathetic. He understood that both the context and the roles of individual matters, Hitler, Churchill, Roosevelt, Stalin, Mao, were all products of their times in the 20th century, but they also all made an enormous difference to what happened in that century. We have only to ask, I think, what would have happened, for example, if Hitler had been killed in the First World War, if Mao had died on the Long March, if Roosevelt had died of polio, if Churchill had died when he was knocked down on Fifth Avenue at the beginning of the 1930s, or if Stalin had died of his appendix during the Russian Civil War. I think it is fair to say that history, both for their countries and for the world, would have been very different. As Berlin wrote in a letter to a correspondent in 1987, Individuals can, at crucial moments, and this is, these are his words, send things spinning in some unforeseen or unforeseeable direction. And then he went on. And the same is certainly true of 1917 in Russia. If a brick had fallen on the head of Lenin, goodness me, there might have been an upheaval, a revolution, civil war between the peasants, proletarians, landowners, officers, liberals, heaven knows what. I don't deny that. But the particular outcome could very well have been wholly different from what in fact took place. Also important for Berlin was what he called history-mindedness, that deep understanding of the past in all its complexities and in all its dimensions, which comes only from hard work and sustained thought into getting that picture of the past. And he knew, as I said earlier, that historians' work is never done, but it's always open to modification. For the most part, he was more interested in understanding the past than in seeing how history can be useful to the present. But nevertheless, he understood that history can teach us useful lessons, and he had two in particular that he thought were important. First, and I quote him, if our generation can learn anything from the past, it ought to contemplate two suppositions about human goals. The first is that not all goals are compatible. The second supposition is that human beings in the process of seeking their goals, transform themselves. And by transforming themselves, they alter their goals too. I will go today a bit further, perhaps, than Isaiah Berlin might have done, because my intention is to examine how history can help us think about the world of today and make informed decisions as best we can. History is a subject that is always under attack. People always disagree with it. People always say that it is irrelevant. 
um, Henry Ford famously said history is bunk. It is also always misused. It's misused by demagogues, populist leaders, it's misused by those who would make cases, those who would whip up hatreds of others. And today something else is also happening to history. I think within the profession of history, there are doubts about, among historians about how objective they can ever really be, how accurate a past, picture of the past they can ever really get. Is all knowledge dependent and transitory and affected by those who are trying to make it and understand it? And so I think the attacks on history, some of which are very old, um, the ignorance of history, again, some of which is old and persistent, are also now, I think, helping, a further, further helping to undermine history because of the doubts within the historical profession itself. Nevertheless, I, I believe, and I think Isaiah Berlin would have believed, that we need to take history very seriously indeed. We need to take it seriously partly because others do, partly because it is misused, partly because leaders, groups will promulgate narratives which give them and their people a particular role in the past, a particular claims on the present, and which may denigrate or in fact be actively hostile to other groups. And so I think we need to know what the history is so we can challenge such narratives and challenge such uses of history. I think we also have to be wary that we use history as an excuse. And here is something that I think Berlin believed very strongly, that history, if we talk about the impersonal forces of history, we say really there's nothing you can do, what can you do, um, that's just simply the way human affairs turn out. Berlin believed that that was abdicating both volition, both agency and responsibility. He called the right faith in the impersonal forces in history, the acquiescence in what were just said to be the great currents of history, one of the great alibis, and he felt that it was deeply immoral. How helpful is history in dealing with our world? And let me start by saying what it can't do. I think historians, and we all need to be modest about what we can use history for. History is not trying to find rules that govern human affairs. We leave that to political scientists or sociologists or this new group that is now emerging of super forecasters. What we are looking for is patterns, yes, but we're not looking for laws, and I think that is very important. We may come up with general propositions, which we will test as we look at the past and the present. For example, if the inequalities in society get too great, there may well be upheavals in those societies. But we do not see these as hard and fast laws because we realize that in history, a number of factors are working, often simultaneously affecting each other, and that for the most part, historical events, although they, in Mark Twain's words, rhyme, they do not echo each other, they do not replicate each other. Each historical event is in very important ways different. Having said that, I think we are still better off with history. We must, of course, get the better, the best history we can. We must only validate that history, which is based on solid evidence and solid research. And I think we understand that in the historical profession, and those who love history understand that. There are histories which simply do not measure up. I am always suspicious when I'm reading a history, and the author says, we cannot know what was happening, but we can assume. And I think that's very dangerous. We could only go with what we actually knew, know happened. I think that is very important, and we can try, must always try and get the best evidence we possibly can. But what history can do is, among other things, bring understanding. It can open our minds to a range of possibility. It can help us in formulating questions. And it can offer useful suggestions, pointers, warnings, suggesting possible avenues that the future might take and warning us where we might want to tread carefully. Now, some policymakers recognize that, and I think it makes them better as they try and make decisions about what they ought to do. Let me quote from again from Berlin, who talked about George Kennan, the great American statesman, and in some ways, the father of the American policy of containment of the Soviet Union during the Cold War. And this is how he described Kennan, and I think this is something that we should all strive for. Kennan, and these are notes, really, and I quote Berlin again, deep interest in and constant thought in terms of attitudes, ideas, traditions, what might be called the cultural peculiarities of countries and forms of life 
not simple move after move chess, not just evidence of this document, that document, showing that they wanted, for example, northern Bulgaria or southern Greece, but also mentalities. And I think this gives a sense of where history can be helpful. And we think of the statesman, like Winston Churchill, who had a very strong sense of history, and I think it made him a greater statesman. It helped Ben Bernanke in 2008 in the financial crisis, where he was trying to make decisions about which banks, which institutions should be bailed out, what should be done, that he had studied and actually written about the Great Depression. The military, I think, also understand the importance of insight that can be gained through history. The stakes are so high for the military, the consequences of failure are so great, that history is taken very seriously in military education, and often taken very seriously by the more intelligent and more effective military leaders. Let me quote from the American General Petraeus, who gained experience both in Iraq and Afghanistan. He said, experience has taught me that insightful military leaders are those whose educations and interests are grounded not only in military and political studies, but also informed by the arts and humanities. Or another American general, H.R. McMaster, again, who had experience in Iraq and Afghanistan, who says, when you're reading and thinking about history, you're actually freeing your mind from the day-to-day -day chores and engaging in the subject more deeply. I also think it will serve as a corrective to, as a corrective to a tendency towards wishful thinking that makes the future appear much easier and fundamentally different from the past. And he went on, so while the humility of the historian, historian's sensitivity to the limits of reasoning by historical analogy are important to preserve, historians must engage on contemporary issues. And we have, as I don't need to tell you, many contemporary issues facing at the moment. When I wrote this lecture in February a year ago, I wrote about the range of challenges facing us, and I wrote about environmental challenges, economic ones, security ones, nuclear proliferation. I thought already that we were in a time of reevaluation and transition in the world. But what I had not counted on, like most people, was a pandemic. And that, I think, has thrown into very sharp relief those other issues facing us, the stress on both domestic and international organizations, norms, and values, and the transitoriness of what we had taken to be absolutely normal. We've adapted, but it's now another world that we think back to the world before we began to shut down with the COVID pandemic. What we know, I think, as a result of that pandemic and the other challenges we're facing, is that the nation state, far from being obsolete, as was said at the end of the Cold War, and power, and some nation states, of course, have great power, still matters a lot. And I think what we've also gained a greater appreciation of as a result of the pandemic is human nature itself, our irrational side. And Isaiah Berlin, of course, was very good at recognizing that. Uh, greed, fears, appetites, a tendency to unwarranted optimism. I was looking this morning at all those Americans who are jamming onto airplanes to go home for Thanksgiving. And one understands the impulse, but I think it is unwarranted op optimism. And our ability, which again we've seen, I think, recently, is to try and make facts fit what we want to believe. In other words, to try and explain them away. I think we also need to continue to understand and appreciate history in our world. And I think we're seeing examples of it almost every day because history in its own way has a sort of power. History helps to create identities. It helps to make us as individuals who we are. We are made up at least in part of what has happened to us already and how we've reacted to previous events in our lives, how we have dealt with previous types of people in our lives. We have, are, are, of course, I think, I think Berlin would have agreed, creatures who possess free, free will. We're not condemned by our past to continue to behave in certain ways. But I think we have to recognize that we are shaped often by those pasts. And that is true of groups of people as well, whether those are social groups, ethnic groups, groups marked out by particular qualities, or nations. We are all shaped by the history of our group. And again, that is something we at least need to understand if we are to deal with it. And often the history which we tell ourselves can be misleading. 
And it can be used, as I said earlier on, to create pictures and images of others which are not the full extent of what those others are. In fact, can often be very misleading. We've seen this, I think, sadly, recently in human history around the world, where political leaders will appeal to versions of the past to whip up enmity against others. I don't need to give you too many examples, but let me just refer to one which I'm sure we're all familiar with. And that is what happened to Yugoslavia in the 1990s, where Serbian nationalists, Croatian nationalists, and eventually Bosnian nationalists as well, created and called upon histories which were very partial, very one-sided. For example, Serbian nationalists used the Battle of Kosovo in 1389 as an example of how Serbs had always fought as Christians against Muslim invaders of Europe, had always fought on the front lines of Christianity. When you actually look into the history of the Battle of Kosovo, the picture, not surprisingly, is more complex. The Battle of Kosovo indeed did have Serbs fighting um, Muslim invaders, but it also had Serbs fighting on the sides of the Muslims. The son of Prince Lazar, who was killed at the Battle of Kosovo, ended up working for the Sultan. So the picture was more complex than modern use of it would appear, but that picture was a very powerful one. And we've seen the same, for example, with the Rohingya in Burma, where it has been claimed by those who are persecuting them that they are not truly inhabitants of Burma, that they have come very recently, that they don't belong. And that simply is not true. In many cases, they have been there for many generations. But such histories, as we know, can be very powerful and can be used to mobilize people to do things against their neighbors or against those living in their midst, which can be very cruel indeed. History can also be very powerful in mobilizing people for a cause. History can be used to show what had been a golden past and to promise that that golden past will be realized in a golden future. And again, I, all I think can think of examples, but I'd like to just point to ISIS or Daesh, which used the picture of a golden Islamic past when all Muslims lived in harmony to mobilize people to try and recreate that harmony in the future and people, as we know, are prepared to battle, to fight, to die, to do dreadful things in the name of that golden future. History can also be used, unfortunately, to justify inaction. And there's a tendency, I think, in the privileged countries of the world to assume that people in other parts of the world are somehow more adept at war, more warlike, more likely to fight each other. This is wrong, we know that, we, we know that the record of the nations in the West has been a pretty grim one. If you look at Europe, for example, it was responsible for two world wars and dreadful things happened and dreadful losses occurred in those wars. But there is a tendency again to use history to explain away what others are doing or to assume that they're somehow not like us. Again, to go back to the disintegration of Yugoslavia in the 1990s, it was argued by scholars in the West and then by a number of Western statesmen that there was no point in intervening in what was happening in Yugoslavia because those people had always been like that. They had always fought each other, they always would. And this was a recipe, I think, for non-intervention, a recipe for disaster. History is also used, and that's a game where we need to be aware of it and be able to challenge it, to make claims. China claimed to bet on the basis of a history which, quite frankly, can be debated and contested. For much of its long history, Tibet was essentially autonomous, independent, in, in days when such words didn't have perhaps the same meaning as they do today. There may have been a tenuous relationship between the Dalai Lama, the ruler of Tibet, and the faraway government in Beijing, but it was just that, a very tenuous relationship. But that has become the basis for Chinese, China's claim to Tibet. And the Chinese government now makes them the claims to the South China Seas on the basis of what is in fact very tenuous history. And so if we are to challenge such claims, which are of course put forward with great authority, then we have to know what the basis for those claims is. It is also the tendency of governments, and perfectly understandable, to use history to bolster claims about their current policies or their current, current stances, to argue that what they're doing is the result of a long history of civilization is normal. Get this, I think, in Russia, where Putin calls very deliberately 
on the Russian past and argues that Russia is somehow a special civilization, always has been and always will be. Now again, unless we know something of the history, it is impossible to challenge such, such, such claims. The Chinese government, the party, uses Confucianism today in China to argue that harmony, obedience, have always been part of what the Chinese, what makes the Chinese state work, and that the role of, of the subject in China has always been to obey those in authority. It's a very one-sided and partial interpretation of Confucianism, but again, has a considerable deal of power. Again, China, which I think I'm using so many examples from China because it has, and its peoples and its leaders have a very strong sense of history. China casts itself internationally as a benevolent state, one that does not use military force and has never used military force to achieve its ends. And that is to ignore a great deal of Chinese history when China used its armies to expand its borders. And my short answer always to people who say, well, the Chinese were never an expansionist power, is to say, look at a map of the Ming Dynasty, which came to an end in 1344, and then look at a map of the Qing Dynasty, which followed it and you will see a huge increase in the amount of land controlled by China during the Qing. The Chinese also argue that the One Belt, One Road initiative, which is now linking China to many parts of the world and, and often in a, a, in a superior, inferior relationship, was really just a, is really just a modern version of the Silk Road, and the Silk, that the Silk Road itself was about sharing, about benevolence, about cooperation. And so again, I think we need at least to be able to say, wait a minute, this history is interesting, but there is perhaps another side to it. I think we also need history, if we are to properly understand both ourselves and others whom we deal with. We tell ourselves stories about ourselves, and we need to examine those because those stories are not always correct or are partial. And so, for example, the United States tells itself a story, or Americans tell themselves a story, that the United States has never been an imperialist power. And if you tell that story to those countries around the United States, including my own country, Canada, we might take uh, objection to it. We might see it in rather a different way. Mexico, Central America, even Canada, have felt at times the difficulties of living next to the United States, and at times have suffered incursions invasions from the United States. My own country, Canada, tells itself a story that we are a gentle, tolerant, and peaceful people, which may be true for the most part, but it ignores the fact that we have sent troops to fight in major wars, four major wars, in the 20th century. And it ignores the side of the Canadian character. And I only have to say to you, have you ever seen a Canadian hockey game? And you will know what I mean about there being another side to the Canadian character. And I think, again, history can help us to understand others, to understand how history has shaped them and how they might behave, why they might behave in certain ways, and how they might react to certain things that we do. To understand Russia today, I think it is extremely important to understand both Russian history before Bolshevism, the failures of Bolshevism, the humiliation that many Russians felt when Russia, the Russian Federation, fell to pieces and Russia lost its empire that it had acquired in the center of Europe after the Second World War. And that loss and that memory of past greatness is something which I think is very important in understanding the policies of President Putin and those around him. They themselves are conscious of his past. They themselves talk about it. And I think it is very much a factor in how they behave today. And I think we need to understand the history of modern Iraq if we want to understand why the invasion and occupation forces met resistance after the invasion had taken place. The Iraqis had learned, partly when the British came in after the First World War, not to trust outsiders who they suspect with reason want to get their hands on their resources, in particular oil. What history can also do, I think, is offer some warnings to those who possess great power. Um, power brings its own sort of arrogance. If you're very powerful, you tend to think you can do whatever you want and get away with whatever you want. That's not always the case. Even great powers can make mistakes. Even great powers can lose their power. Knowing the history of the Roman Empire, I think, is salutary in that respect. There is a famous statement 
which an advisor to George W. Bush made at the time of the invasion and occupation of Iraq. It was probably Karl Rove, um, it's never been entirely established, but pro probably him. A journalist asked him if it was wise for the United States and its British ally to go into Iraq. And he said, and, and, and the statement is worth remembering, he said, we're an empire now, and when we act, we create our own reality. And while you're studying that reality, judiciously as you will, we'll act again, creating other new realities, which you can study too, and that's how things will sort out. We're history's actors, and you, all of you, will just be left to study what we do. And of course, we know what happened to that attitude, to that invasion, that arrogance, a history could have offered a warning, and that particular bit of history should be a warning. When the American and British forces went into Iraq, they were not prepared for what they would find. They had not been encouraged to study the country, its peoples, its social structures, its political structures. And there, is, there are stories, true, that a number of the top officers sent back to their booksellers the copies of T.E. Lawrence's The Seven Pillars of Wisdom, written about the Middle East at the time of the First World War, in what was a desperate and rather late attempt to try and understand what Iraq was all about and what Iraqis were all about. And so I think to understand ourselves and others, history is extremely important. And what history can further do is remind us again and again, and again that others are not just like us. We tend to assume that people we deal with are just like us. And there's a danger, I think, in being an English speaker, which of course I am, in that it, the language is so dominant that we don't feel we need to learn other languages. And if you don't, earn, uh, if you don't learn other languages, you miss a very important way of trying to understand others. If you can't communicate to people in their own language, you will only communicate with those who speak English, and they may not represent the population of a place or a country on the whole. To understand others, the history, the language, the culture, it is all important. And failure to understand can lead to mistakes, as Robert McNamara, who was the US Secretary of Defense in the Vietnam War, for much of the Vietnam War, said, in his memoir, in retrospect. He said, we viewed the people and leaders of South Vietnam in terms of our own experience. We saw in them a thirst for and a determination to fight for freedom and democracy. The Americans assumed that the pain of the war, which they were indeed suffering, would get too much for the North Vietnamese, whereas the North Vietnamese were prepared to take losses on a scale unimaginable to the United States. And McNamara, who spent much of his life after he resigned as Secretary of Defense trying to understand where the Americans had gone wrong, wrong in Vietnam, said, our misjudgments of friend and foe alike reflected our profound ignorance of the history, culture, and politics of the people in the area and the personalities and habits of their leaders. History, and this is not yet another on my list, can help if we can learn from experience. It's been very striking in the past few months which countries have done well in dealing with the pandemic. Notably, Asian countries have done very well, and many countries in the West have not done well. And one of the reasons for that is that Asian countries had had to deal with the SARS epidemic of the 1990s, and they had learned and found out how to institute public health me measures. They had learned, and their people had internalized the use of the mask. It's simply something that people do automatically, we are learning those lessons very sadly because our previous experience of pandemic was either polio, which was dealt with by, by a vaccine, or before that, the influenza epidemic. And too often, our public health authorities were thinking in terms of another influenza epidemic, not something like COVID. African countries, too, have been effective for the most part in dealing with the COVID pandemic because they already had to deal with Ebola and HIV AIDS. Yet another benefit of history, I think, is it makes us question our own assumptions, which are often unspoken. We don't always remember, we don't always look at the sort of things we, we, we assume, because we don't need to. Uh, we all tend to assume certain things, what a great historian once called the unspoken assumptions, but very things indeed. And we can see many examples in history of peoples being trapped by assumptions and they often have explained away uncomfortable facts. The military assumed that the war would be one of attack. They did not pay much attention to the defense. They found it less interesting.
decisive battles in the war to come. By the time of 1914, all the major powers only had offensive plans. They hadn't bothered or had given up updating defensive plans. They knew, however, because they observed wars around the world, that the weaponry was getting so effective and so strong that the defense was becoming very strong. They had seen what had happened in the American Civil War when soldiers dug in and put barbed wire in front of their trenches and used rapid firing rifles and artillery. They had seen what had happened in the Balkan Wars just before the First World War. They had seen what had happened in the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1905 and they explained it away. They said, well, those are wars in other places by people who do not have the enormous military culture and education and abilities that we have. And so history, like a sort of useful warning system, warns us against getting too locked into our own assumptions and not questioning them. It also helps us, if we pay attention to it, to formulate questions. If we don't ask good questions, we're not going to have a hope of finding good answers. And so asking questions, what if we do such and such? What if we follow certain measures in trying to deal with the pandemic? What if we have a lockdown? What if we have quarantine? How have those been effective in other pandemics? And how have governments and societies worked to make sure that they are effective? And I think this is important. What if we follow a certain policy? What is likely to happen? We often reason when we do use history through analogies. We use episodes in the past and we say, well, what's happening in the present is rather like this particular episode in the past. Analogies, reasoning from analogy, reasoning from similar events in the past can be extremely helpful, can help us to formulate questions, can help us come up with policies. But one word of warning, we have to be extremely careful with analogies. The danger is, that you can get locked in to a particular analogy and it can become your guiding motto, so to speak. And you will forget that there might be another analogy that might be more appropriate to a particular situation. And so keeping an open mind, always being open to other possibilities as you formulate your questions, using history to try and, and come up with policies for the present and the future is enormously important. Let me just take one example of an analogy which is used over and over and over again. And that is the appeasement analogy. In the 1930s, the democracies watched the rise of the dictatorships and the militarists with concern. They were aware that there were a number of nations that wanted to revise the peace settlements left over from the end of the First World War. They knew that Italy under Mussolini had the goal of trying to build a new Roman empire. They knew that Hitler's Germany was rearming and that Hitler had pledged, he said so openly, to break what he called the chains of the Treaty of Versailles and to reestablish Germany as the dominant power in the heart of Europe. They knew that the Japanese militarists, certainly by the 1930s, wanted to build an empire and were building up their naval and military forces at a very fast rate indeed. They knew that smaller countries such as Hungary wanted to revise their borders because they were left dissatisfied with what had happened at the end of the First World War. And yet the democracies were slow to move, slow to work together. What they tried to do, and this is what the policy of appeasement was, was to accept the, what they felt were the legitimate claims of such powers in order to appease them, in order to quiet them down. So if Mussolini were allowed to take Ethiopia, it would quiet him down and he would no longer be a problem for the rest of Europe. If Hitler were allowed to have more military forces than he had been allowed under the treaty, if he were allowed to take back certain parts of Germany, if he were allowed even to take back Danzig, which was a free city, then he would be appeased. If he were allowed to have an Anschluss, a union with Austria, which had been forbidden in the Treaty of Versailles, then he would be appeased and he would become like any other European statesman. If the Japanese militarists were able to build something of an empire on the continent of Asia, taking Manchuria from China, they would be appeased and they would no longer cause trouble. Well, as we know, it didn't work. And so appeasement has become shorthand for a failure to deal with aggressive powers. The trouble with the analogy is it can so easily be misused. Let me give examples of where it has been misused. Antony Eden, 
the British Prime Minister in the mid 1950s saw Gamal Abdel Nasser, the new leader of Egypt, as someone who to his mind was like Mussolini or Hitler. And he had dealt with both in the 1930s. And so he felt that he had to be stopped when Nasser tried to nationalize the Suez Canal. Eden in collusion with France and Israel tried to invade and seize it back. And it was a mistake. It was a mistake, first of all, because Nasser was not like Hitler or Mussolini. He didn't want to expand Egypt. He simply wanted to control what was in Egyptian soil. And it was a mistake because it wasn't, it didn't work. Um, it was a humiliation. The United States would not support Britain and France and Israel. And it was a mark of the British decline and, and speeded that decline. Kennedy, John F. Kennedy was afraid of being called an appeaser. His father, in fact, had been probably one. And so he was pushed in the Cuban Missile Crisis to show that he could be tough with the Soviets. Fortunately for us, he decided that the appeasement analogy wasn't the one that worked here, but it did work for Kennedy and other Americans in Vietnam. They went into Vietnam with the experience of appeasement of the 30s very much in mind. And it was, of course, to be a disaster for the United States. They assumed that North Vietnam was capable of causing the sort of disruption in the international order that Mussolini's Italy and militarist Japan or Hitler's Germany had caused. And as George Kennan pointed out, it wasn't. It was a small, impoverished country which wanted a particular local goal, not happy, a happy ending for those in South Vietnam who didn't want to be part of a united Vietnam, particularly under communist rule but it was not a place that the Americans should have fought or so people have argued ever since. And the analogy perhaps got them into the trouble and made it more difficult for them to get out. Finally, I think history offers a series of useful warnings. It shows us how mistakes were made in the past. In the outbreak of the First World War, for example, all sides made assumptions about the other sides, which many of which were not true. Uh, Germany assumed that Russia was determined to confront it militarily, and the German high command argued in 1914 that if we are to fight Russia, we must do it now because we won't be able to do it in three years to come. And so assumptions about others, particularly in moments of crisis, can be very dangerous. So too can wishful thinking, thinking that the opponents will do what you want rather than what they want. And so Hitler assumed that the British would see sense and make peace with them. He didn't believe they would go on fighting. Stalin believed that Hitler would see no point in attacking Germany and then attacking the Soviet Union because the Soviet Union was already supplying to Germany what the German war machine needed. Both those assumptions were wrong as we, as we know. And so history reminds us that even great leaders in the past can get it wrong. It also reminds us that even very clever people can make mistakes and get it wrong. Um, we have to think only recently of the mistake, in my view, that the coalition forces made in Iraq when they dissolved the Ba'ath Party, therefore putting people out of jobs who had the knowledge to run the country to make sure that the water supply was all right, to make sure that things went on. By dissolving the Iraqi army, all they did was turn out a lot of people with military experience plus their weapons who now had no reason to want to support them, in fact, had every reason to want to challenge them. And so what history can do is warn us against the mistakes that were made in the past, warn us against hasty actions, warn us against moving in ways that do not reflect the realities of, of the situation, assuming that what we want to do will turn out the way that we want to do it. And finally, perhaps, I think what history can do is offer us some sort of humility. We tend always to think in the present age that we know better than people in the past, that we are clever, that we have more tools at our disposal, that we know more than they do, that we can, in other words, do better than they did. And I think a sort of humility is, is, is needed, that we are not necessarily clever. We too are going to make mistakes, we too are going to get it wrong. We can see examples of this if we look around our world at the moment. Uh, British thinker John Kerry said, one of history's most important tasks is to bring home to us how keenly, honestly, and painfully past generations pursued aims that now seem to us wrong or disgraceful. We can look at the past and we can see very clever people who got it 
very wrong. And I think that sort of humility, as we deal with what I think is an increasingly turbulent present, a time in which there is clearly transition in power going on in the world, clearly great issues facing the world, that sort of humility, I think, will not cripple us. I think it will simply make us think more openly and more possibly about the sort of issues that we are facing and help us, as I said earlier, to ask questions. John Gaddis, the American political historian, said that history is something like the rearview mirror in a car. If you only look back, you will land in a ditch, but it helps us to know where you've come from and who else is on the road. It helps us when we're driving along a road, as we do in Canada, saying in the winter this bridge freezes or this curve gets icy in the winter. I'd like to conclude with leaving the last word, as I should, to Isaiah Berlin, and I will quote from his historical inevitability. For no one will wish to deny that we do often argue about the best among the possible courses of action open to human beings in the present and past in future, in fiction and in dreams, that historians and detectives and judges and juries do attempt to establish as well as they are able what those, these possibilities are. History allows us to think about possibilities and I can think of no wiser words than those of Isaiah Berlin's. Thank you. Dear Margaret, um, it's difficult for me not to look at you because mm -hmm. that way the, the audience thinks I'm looking at you, but I actually have to look there because then you see me better and you, you have a sensation that I'm looking at actually at you. So thank you very much for your um, illuminating, essay, illuminating essay, really a lecture, illum illuminating talk on the role of history and on the benefits that history, and learning it and knowing it can give us. Also, thank you for mentioning uh, Isaiah Berlin at least once. We feel, we feel, feel flattered by it. So you are still able to submit your questions in the commentary of Facebook and also in slide.o, but uh, there, are, there are a few that have been submitted and I will be happy to deliver them to you, Margaret. Um, maybe I would like to start with one of my own. So you mentioned examples of uh, individuals and societies that have managed to learn something from their history. You mentioned examples of ones who haven't, sometimes stubbornly. Uh, do you have an idea of um, what are the preconditions or uh, factors that uh, come into play into whether a, a certain society at some point is able or isn't able to, uh, to learn from its history? I think there are a couple of factors. One is the nature of the society itself. There are certain societies in which history has always been taken very seriously as something that perhaps helps to build a people, build unity among people, but also as something that helps them to understand who they are and where they might be going. And so the French, I think, take their history very seriously indeed. Um, it doesn't mean they don't argue about it. When they tried to commemorate the, was it the uh, 200th anniversary of, of the French Revolution, um, there were tremendous arguments about what that revolution meant, but it is seen as a foundational event in the shaping of modern France. And, and I think the French do take their history very seriously. The Chinese, of course, take their history seriously. You have Chinese statesmen, Mao including, who would refer quite casually in conversation or writings to people who had lived millennia ago, you know, the Duke of Zhou. And Mao would say, as the Duke of Zhou once said, well, the Duke of Zhou lived, I think, in the seventh century BC. And difficult to think of many Western statesmen doing that. Perhaps the French would, but for a lot of Western statesmen, their societies look ahead. And I think that's particularly true in the case of the United States. Um, perhaps a bit also in my own country, Canada, because these were societies built very largely by people who came from elsewhere and who wanted to make new lives for themselves. And so what you get, I think, in such societies is a tendency to look ahead and say, we can do whatever we want. It's the future that matters and, and the past doesn't matter. I think these days we're coming to a greater appreciation of our past and, and that's perhaps as it should be. 
But I think a second reason, I think you know, social and, and, and cultural attitudes matter, but I think a second reason why some societies take history more seriously than others is to do with education. And not all societies have good history education. Um, in North America, a lot of students go, can come through um, primary and, and secondary schools without knowing much of the history of their own country, um, much less the history of countries around them or, or the rest of the world. And I think that is a shame because it means that they don't have the capacity even to be curious about history um, or to ask questions about it. And that I think is, is something that is a defect of education in many countries, because I do think knowing how we got here and how our institutions came to be the way they are and how our values came to be the way they are is very important. So I think two reasons. Thank you very much. That, uh, that satisfies me as for my question. But uh, now I would like to turn to some of the questions that are submitted by the audience. And um, here will be the first one. Would you say that the new perspectives on world history added recently by focusing on subaltern and oppressed groups can help us avoid some mistakes in facing current challenges? Did you get it? Well, yeah, I think one of the best developments in recent history has been looking at those groups which weren't studied in the past. You know, that was partly a, a reflection of the fact that the records were kept by those who are literate which until recently was a small proportion of society, but also I think affected by the feeling that what did it really matter? What an ordinary farmer felt? What did it really matter? What an ordinary shoemaker felt? What did it matter that a woman felt? What did it matter that children felt and thought? And that's changed. I think as our societies have, we hope become more inclusive and, and more concerned with, with bringing people in to greater equality I think we have recognized that we must know something about the past of groups that we didn't look at before. And so there's been an explosion of history as you, as sometimes called subaltern history, history of, of, of those in the lower levels. Well, the subaltern is, is one of the lower ranking people in an army, but subaltern history refers generally to people who had not been regarded as the objects of historical study in the past. And that's good. I mean, we know a lot more and it's given us a fuller picture of societies to know about what the farmers thought, to know about what the artisans thought, to know about what women thought. That I think has been very important. But that to me doesn't mean we should neglect the study of the other side of history, because those at the lower levels of society and those marginalized groups in society are affected and have been affected by what those in power are doing and are affected and have been affected by power structures. And so to understand the complexities of power societies, we need to understand how they worked, who was in charge and who wasn't, and how all those histories come together to make a full picture of society. All right. Um, there's a question from, uh, an un anonymous question from Anna Tabite, uh, who is, by the way, a member of the Zai, Zai Berlin Society of, of Latvia. Um, which historical historical discourses, in your opinion, should be researched more and re-evaluated to transform liberal democracy in order to save it? So pretty loaded question, I assume, but uh, maybe you can handle it. Yes, I'm trying to think what sort of historical discourses um, the questioner might be thinking of. I suppose what we always need to do is partly tied to what I was saying in, in my earlier answer. We we need to look at all members of society um, and we need to look at their stories because a truly democratic society is one which treats its members, whether those are groups or individuals with respect and understands who they are and understands the contribution that they might be able to make, make to society. And so I think if liberal democracies are to become stronger, and of course, as we know, they, they are under challenge, what we need to do both is to not, not celebrate our history so much, but to evaluate our history, to understand how our institutions were built, to understand the struggles that went on in the past to get greater democracy and greater rights for people. But I think we also have to be prepared to challenge and confront those histories which would undermine such values. Um, I'm thinking of Hungary, for example, where Viktor Orban is talking about how a new kind of illiberal democracy and is 
pushing a very particular view of Hungarian history. Hungary is the rather like, uh, I suppose, some of the Serb nationalist histories. Hungary as the Christian country, which has always stood on the front lines of Europe against the Muslim hordes and has not been appreciated by the rest of Europe. And I think such histories must be challenged, must take into account the fact that yes, most Hungarians are Christian today and Hungary has been a Christian country for a long time, but it was not always so. It was not always a Christian country. Um, and it has within its borders and within the Hungarian population, different versions of Christianity. And I think that needs to be understood. And I think what also needs to be understood and, and not just in the case of Hungary, that the pattern of interaction between the Christian Europe and the Muslim East has not always been one of confrontation, that quite often it has been one of cultural interchange, a mutual influence, and often cooperation. And I think this is necessary to understand if people are to understand their own countries and to, I think, develop a look, an outlook which is not to exclude others, but to try and include them and understand them. And so I suppose this is, this is what I think we should be trying to do. So, thank you. There is a question that sli is slightly focused on the local context of the Baltics, but uh, on the other hand, it's also pretty general. But, uh, and it goes like this. If several social groups keep emphasizing different partial parts of a complex history in a debate, and then, then come examples like Latvians do about their authoritarian regime in the 30s, or on the handling of the citizenship rights in the early 1990s, what would be your advice? How can a fruitful, more complex conversation be restored? That is, on topics that are historical topics that are still to this, to this day uh, very heatedly debated. I think of course, it's always difficult when a country has come out of a difficult or dark period in its history, how to deal with the difficult topics in the past. And I think the fear always is that if you try and deal with them, you may splinter the country still further. And the Spanish, for example, have taken a very long time to deal with their civil war. And I think there was a fear after the end of the Franco regime that things were too raw, too sensitive, too difficult to talk about. And it's a judgment call. I can understand why, why newly independent nations or, or nations that have newly come together or gained their independence are worried about that because they're afraid of losing what they already have. But it seems to me at some point necessary and indeed a sign of maturity. Um, the great British historian Sir Michael Howard once said that there are two kinds of history. He said there is the nursery school history and the adult history, I think was his phrase. And the nursery school history is good because it makes you feel better about yourself. It tells you nice stories. But at a certain point, you have to grow up and look at the difficult bits of the story as well. Because if you don't, they're going to linger there under the ground. And one of the problems I think that Yugoslavia had by the 1990s was that the history of the Second World War and earlier and the knowledge and, and stories of the often dreadful things that the different ethnic groups in Yugoslavia had done to each other had been buried. It was not talked about, but people still often knew about it because people told stories in their families. And when things began to go wrong, those old hatreds and old stories bubbled up and they'd never been properly examined. And so hard as it can be for countries, I think it is probably desirable in the long run, but as I say, it's, it's a matter of when and how you do it to examine the past. Countries such as Germany, which have examined its own past. And the Germans have had a very heavy burden to bear because of their Nazi past, but they have done so. They, 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 yes, they were partly pressured to do it from outside, but they also had to deal with those inside Germany who said we must do it. And I think it has made present day Germany a stronger and more ma mature society in that it accepts the dreadful things that were done in the name of the German people and often by the German people in the past, but they haven't denied that they happened. And so I think, difficult as it is, I mean, there are, there are aspects I know of Baltic history, which I think have to be examined. And I, it's not an easy process, and I'm not saying there's any right way of doing it, but it seems to me that countries that have done it actually come out often stronger. And the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions that South Africa had, for example, and a number of Latin American countries have done equivalents, have, I think, 
help to bring out into the daylight some of the things that have remained buried. And I think on the whole have been better for those countries, but it's not an easy thing to do. Would you, would you dare name some, exa some examples of what you just mentioned as Baltic uh, topics that uh, Baltic societies should try to come to terms with? Well, I think the conflicts you had after the First World War, which were civil conflicts in, in, in many cases, um, conflicts, yes, they were, they were political as well, conflicts, conflicts between whites and reds, um, but which deeply divided societies. Um, authoritarian governments, as, as the questioner mentioned in, for example, Latvia in the 1930s, should be looked at. Treatment of minorities should be looked at. Um, these are, as I say, not easy questions. And for Latvia, of course, the, the issue, the continuing issue of the Russian speaking Latvians who, who live in Latvia, the whole issue of citizenship and, and Estonia faces a similar issue. And so, no, these are things I think that, you know, no country is, has an unblemished record. Um, you know, in my own country, Canada, we are trying to deal with the ways in which we've treated our indigenous peoples. And it is not something we can be proud of. And it is something that we need to examine because for too long, we simply haven't talked about it. Um, are there any regimes in Europe today that would need to be affronted and here's an explanation affronted as opposed to appeasement approach you know and if yes which ones do you think those might be and how and who should or could do it so well one uh, example I can think uh, of sorry uh, yeah. just uh, the last sentence even if European slash Western politicians saw empires being built or rebuilt today, do you think they can do anything about it? But yeah, so sorry to interrupt you, but no, 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 that's but, fine. It's well, it, it seems to me there are almost two different questions. I mean, one of the issues with building empires is is taking of territory. So I'll answer that first. First, I and mean, there's been a, a sort of agreement in the world that taking territory by force is no longer valid. In other words, if you conquer a piece of territory, that in itself is not good enough grounds for maintaining control of that territory. And I think it's striking how very few annexations through war there have been since 1945. There's been, as I say, this general understanding that you don't do it. And in fact, I think in a number of parts of the world, such as Africa, um, more there is an understanding that African governments don't want to open up the issue of borders because so many issues would suddenly come up that it, it would be a disaster. And so when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait at the beginning of the 1990s, he was turned out and that was concerted international action. And I think it was a very important precedent. But what has happened recently is we're seeing two things happen, happening. One is that we're seeing the building of empire in other ways. And I think both China and Russia are doing that. Of course, the United States did it in the past. They don't take over control directly, but they exercise indirectly a great deal of control over those who are running parts of the world. And the Chinese are also using the power of their financial, their financial power, their power to make loans to try and control governments in different parts of the world in order that they would do things that the Chinese approve of. For example, voting the way China wants at the UN or allowing China to build ports or allowing China to have bases. And this seems to me is an example of, of a new type of empire building. The second question, which I think was implied, uh, well, sorry, just to continue this, what has happened, however, that there have been a couple of cases where states have actually seized territory recently and got away with it. Putin's seizure of Crimea, I think, was a very significant breach of that idea that taking territory by, by, by military force is no longer valid as a basis for a claim. And I think the move by Israel to annex effectively um, and claim sovereignty over parts of the West Bank and the Golan Heights, well, the Golan Heights they've already done, and the acceptance of that by the United States, if not the rest of the international community, is another breach. But the other side of the question is, are there times when democracies should be standing up to powers that in their view are behaving badly. And I think definitely we see this today. And I would say in Europe, what you have 
in the case of both Poland and Hungary is you have two members of the European Union who are actually disobeying the rules and laws of the European Union. Um, they are dismantling institu democratic institutions, they're packing the courts, they're taking over the free media, and they seem to be getting away with it. And of course, they support each other in the EU Parliament and in EU councils. And this, I think, is very bad because the more they get away with it, the more they will be encouraged to move down this undemocratic path, and the more it may encourage other countries that want to follow the same path. And so I think in this case, what should be done is that the European Union should get firm. It has, after all, considerable political and financial power to influence what's going on both in Poland and, and Hungary, if only to cut off the extensive subsidies that it gives to both countries. And I think this is something that reluctantly a number of people in the EU, EU and a number of leaders in the EU are coming around to. But I think my own view is this is something that should be done. If you want to be a member of a club, then you have to follow the rules. And if you don't follow those rules, then you shouldn't get the benefits of being part of that club. What do you think are the obstacles why, as of now, the governing institutions of EU are so reluctant to uh, take stronger measures against what I think blatantly authoritarian tendencies in certain countries? I think partly because the EU has got other problems that it's dealing with. It's dealing with Brexit. Um, you know, that, that is a long running problem and it's not actually going to go away even if the British do crash out without a deal at the end of this year. It is still going to be a problem. What is the future relationship between the EU and Britain, which remains, of course, an important country, both economically and, and for security reasons. And so I think there's been a reluctance in the EU to deal with too many problems and issues at once. And of course, I think the EU is also aware that it has other problems. Russia is doing its best to cause problems in the East for the EU. And I think what the EU worries about is if it gets tough with, with Poland and Hungary, it may also start to face problems in other Eastern countries, Eastern members of the EU. And so I think there has been a reluctance. And of course, what they've also had is, is the capacity of Poland and Hungary to support each other and block EU measures. And but this is something I think that could be overcome if the key countries in the EU were determined enough to do so. All right. Thank you. Um, there's a bit more challenging question. I suppose you are familiar with uh, uh, Berlin's doctrine of the hedgehog and the fox. Mm -hmm. you, you have heard about it, right? I have. I have. Good. Uh, the question goes as follows. Uh, whom, if any, of the world leaders over the past 100 or so years, in, in your view, stand out as either totally or primarily a Berlin fox or a Berlin hedgehog or maybe a was, hybrid. Okay, I always have to get it right. The, the hedgehog knows one thing yes. and the fox knows many things. I think it's, it's that follows, way around. Hedgehog follows one overarching idea. Yeah, yeah. Fox cho chooses a pl pluralistic approach, yes. Yeah, well, I think those leaders who have been driven by powerful and all-encompassing ideologies tend to be hedgehogs. Um, they have one explanation for everything in the world and they have a goal, which to them at least is very clear. And so I would say that Hitler was on the hedgehog side of the spectrum. He had in mind making Germany the dominant power in Europe, if not the world, and more than that, making the Aryan race, as he defined it, the dominant race in the world and he was prepared really to subordinate all else to it. And Stalin wanted to build, again, I would put on the hedgehog side of the spectrum, wanted to build socialism in one country and make the Soviet Union the center of socialism in the world as he defined it. And again, I think he had one explanation for how the world worked and one overriding goal. But even the hedgehogs, I think, have been capable of compromise and at least temporary retreat when confronted with obstacles. Those who are more foxes, I think, have tended on the whole, I think, to be leaders in democratic countries because if they didn't have that capacity to have several um, goals in mind at the same time, they probably would not get elected. 
although we do have examples of democratically elected leaders who can be rather more like hedgehogs. I mean, I would argue that Donald Trump, soon to be the ex-president of the United States, has really one overriding goal, and that is the preservation of himself and his interests. And so all else really seems to me has been subordinate to that. But most great political leaders in democracies have to be capable of having a number of different goals, because if they don't, they're not going to be reelected the next time. They have to build coalitions. They have to appeal to numbers of different peoples. They may have certain goals that they think are very important. They will clearly have a hierarchy of goals, but I think they will understand that they may not achieve all those goals and that quite often there is a trade-off. Um, to be a successful democratic politician, you certainly have to know where you're going and have to know what you want to do, but you also have to be prepared in some cases to wait or to abandon certain goals or to make compromises among different goals. And I think, um, but Berlin, when he talks about the idea that um, goals can be incompatible, um, would have understood how important this is, a, how important a realization this is for democratic leaders. They can't get everything they want, but they can get some of it. Thank you. We have a question about, um, in a way, historical research methodology uh, from our friend Sandis. Uh, the world is constantly changing, but do we change a way how we look at changes, and that is at the historical changes and the way history unfolds? And if yet, do contemporary research met methods in history lead to different points of view towards uh, certain historical events? And uh, perhaps also, are there examples you could name of, the, of such methods? I think historical methods are always changing. Um, we used to rely a lot on the written record, which I think has, has certain value, but we relied more on certain kinds of records than others. We tended to think records written by people in powers, positions of power or authority were perhaps more important than records written by ordinary people. And I think we've moved a long way from that. Um, we recognize that diaries, letters, and personal notes, written often by people who, who are not the great movers of history can be extremely important in trying to create a picture of a time. And the British had a project before and, and during the Second World War called Mass Observation, in which they asked people all over the country of all sorts of social classes, all types, to simply keep diaries and to write down their, their observations as much as they could every day. And this is the most extraordinary source for getting a sense of what the British as a whole were thinking. Um, and, and we've also started to use other sorts of sources. We've started to use, of course, we've always worked um, using the benefits of archeology, span but we also use things like material objects, um, postcards, cartoons, movies, things that people create and consume, which also give us an idea of what they were thinking and feeling. And so historical research, I think, is always broadening out and trying to find other things. And now, of course, we have the terrific problem of electronic media. And the danger is going to be in the future, there'll simply be too much for anyone ever to be able to deal with. If you think of trying to manage emails or tweets and trying to get some sort of sense out of what those might actually show about a period, you can just imagine how very difficult it's going to be. Um, as far as, as the sorts of things Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting the first part, part of the question. I mean, it was historical methodology and evidence. What, there was another part to it. Well, the intro part was like, um, is the way we see historical changes and we look back at historical changes actually changing itself? Oh, yes, uh, that's an interesting question. Yes, I think we, we are asking different things in the past and so while we might have been interested in political change in the past. We're now interested in social change. We're interested in change of attitudes. We're interested, in fact, in change of emotions. There's a, there's a whole sort of interesting exploration going on into human emotions and what do we mean when we use the word love or fear or hatred. Um, and so, yes, I think we do change in the sorts of things that we're looking at in the past and the sort of changes we're interested in. Thank you. Uh, our time for Q&A is almost at an end. Unfortunately, there will be questions that I won't be able to ask, so just maybe this last one before we say goodbye to you. Uh, 
Why do you think Berlin's approach towards history of ideas, that is, linking political ideas with arts and culture, has not, has not been a bigger part of what historians do? Well, I think it is quite a big, a big part of what historians do. I think we, we are perhaps not enough, but like him, I think a lot of us try and, and draw lines among different types of activities in the past. And so, for example, there's some very interesting new work on the Renaissance, which tries to link what was happening in the arts to what was happening politically. Um, a very interesting new book, which argues that the violence of much of Renaissance life and the wars among the city-states actually affected the arts uh, that, that were being created at the time and helped to produce some of the great masterworks of the arts. And so I think we do, perhaps not enough, but I think we are aware of the need to try and link ideas as Berlin did. Berlin was always, I think, interested in how ideas were effective and came out of a particular time and was interested in the person who developed those ideas. What was it that had affected that person's life? And I think that is what we should be doing. We need to make our inquiries as broad as possible to try and understand developments in the past. Thank you, Margaret. Although many questions have flown in in these last few minutes, we have to respect the schedule and we have to respect your fatigue too, which I assume might have been coming in. Thank you very much for your il illuminating lecture and also may perhaps even more so answers to, to these questions given by our audience. So uh, I will give a short pause and assume that there's a, there's a grand applause in all the rooms and in all the houses where this was being watched. There. And uh, thank you very much. And uh, now we, we conclude the Q&A part. And uh, before we conclude the whole event, we have a special guest uh, who would like to say a few words. Uh, while you are also st still here with us, I would like to give the floor to His Excellency Ambassador of Canada to Latvia, Mr. Kevin Rex. Uh, thank you very much, Hamad. It's a, a great personal privilege to be here tonight to deliver the closing remarks for the 11th Isaiah Berlin Day here in Riga in the beautiful, although given the current situation, entirely empty National Library of Latvia. You know, one of the great perks of my job are the opportunities I get, once in a lifetime chances really, to meet some of the world's most remarkable people. And back in March BC, before COVID, I was preparing to host Professor McMillan at my home here in Riga. And I simply cannot tell you how excited I was, the embassy team, the event organizers to host here in Latvia, this Canadian legend. I could tell you, Margaret, about the witty banter I had prepared, or rather had my embassy team research in great detail so I could be suitably entertaining for you while you, uh, while you were here. I'm not sure we'll ever be able to calculate just how much the world has suffered as a result of the COVID pandemic, but I can say that I will count the missed opportunity to meet you and host you in person as one of the greatest disappointments I've certainly faced in the past nine months. And so while we were not able to do this in person, your virtual participation was certainly most welcome. Let me start then by thanking you, our distinguished lecturer. Thank you, Professor McMillan, for your deep insights on Isaiah Berlin, history, and the world today. As a policymaker, I noted your words on how history can help us look at the world today that we need to take it seriously and that we need to ask tough questions. And as a diplomat, I noted with great appreciation your insights on the importance of learning about other cultures' history, their traditions, and of course their language. So for that, thank you, or paldias. Now the annual Isaiah Berlin Day serves to promote the ideas and values expressed and defended by Sir Isaiah Berlin. Pluralism, tolerance, and individual liberty. Ideas and values that are so important to both Latvians and Canadians. Diversity and inclusion are, after all, at the heart of modern Canada, and we take great pride in their promotion. An open, free world where people connect with each other and exchange not just goods, but ideas, creates a deeper cultural understanding of who we are, how we live, and how together we can all succeed. Let me congratulate the organizers of today's event, the Doetz Foundation for an Open Society, 
the Isaiah Berlin Society and the National Library of Latvia, as well as the representation of the European Commission in Latvia for their support. The Isaiah Berlin Center will inherit the duties of organizing uh, this event from the Doetz Foundation for an Open Society. And I wish the center, Helmut, great success in all of your future activities to popularize Isaiah Berlin's legacy, his ideas, and his philosophy. And if I may then, Professor, finish by quoting you in the same way that you finished by quoting the great philosopher himself. Uh, from your book, Dangerous Games, The Uses and Abuses of History, please uh, send me an email later if I get this wrong. History, I concluded, should not be written to make the present generation feel good, but to remind us that human affairs are complicated. Thank you. Merci. Valdez. Thank you, Ambassador, for these kind remarks. Um, I suppose this is it. Margaret, thank you for being with, with us again, for being with us on board since March when this was postponed indefinitely and still being uh, ready to participate in this COVID format in the 11th Isaiah Berlin Day. And so I can only echo Valdis and thank again Irina, Yeva and Foundation Duots for doing this for 11 years, and I can hope that we will be capable of holding the ground for who, many, who knows how many years in the future. So yeah, Isaiah Berlin Center will continue to organize, uh, organize this, this tradition among all the other things that we're going to do. Thank you very much everyone who participated uh, and asked your questions and listened and watched us online. Uh, the recording of this lecture and all the proceedings will be preserved and will be published, uh, I hope, even with uh, technical technicalities fixed. And so thank you for being with us. And uh, on the 11th, Isaiah Berlin Day. And thanks, thank you. of course, thank to, you. to the man himself. Thank you. That's it. <laughs>